Thank you. Muchas gracias, Enrique. Uh, my name is Ben Allen. We're going to go ahead and start with our next panel as we get everybody prepared. Uh, thanks so much for that wonderful discussion. Very interesting. Um, we passed a, a kind of an equity formula in California that uh, I'd love to see how it tracks as to what you're doing in Maryland. Um, we're going we're gonna to pivot to to journalism. I think we're all, uh, as elected officials, both uh, avid consumers and sometimes subjects of all sorts of media. And I've, I've been looking forward to this uh, session of the conference. I'm a new member of the New Deal uh, Network from California. Excited to be here. Um, I, I, you know, I think one of the things underscoring our entire conversation today, it's uh, yeah, journalism is, is just such a cornerstone of our democracy, such a fundamental uh, piece of, of a strong democracy. And I'm reminded of that every time I travel to uh, less democratic uh, parts of the world where state-run media tell people uh, you know, only what the leaders want them to hear, uh, and of course, sometimes how they should think. And uh, these are places where journalists are intimidated, where they're imprisoned, they're even killed uh, simply for asking tough questions or speaking truth to power. And of course, here in our own country, uh, we haven't had to uh, look far uh, from seeing how government officials can insult journalists and attempt to spread doubt about the ethical fact-finding work of professionals whose job it is to inform the public. Uh, you know, it, it's wild to think about how, what an important role the, jur the journalists played. And we were talking about the elections. Uh, and I think in the end of the day, one of the lessons learned was that the public generally decided to reject the madness of the election denial. Uh, but that really only comes as a result of journalists repeating over and over and over again, calling out the lies, uh, you know, calling the, 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 the assertions of Trump and all the denialists, uh, the deniers, uh, uh, you know, unfounded. And, and so we owe them such a debt of gratitude as a, as a country and as a democracy. I, I, from my perspective, journalists, I think, can be thought of as democracy's first responders. They serve as government watchdogs. Uh, they share details about emergencies and disasters and dangers, resources, services, scandals, uh, and so much more. Uh, you know, and they provide it in a way that the people can, can, can easily manage. Uh, and so uh, I know many Americans, and I'm sure most of us in this room have been really concerned about the decline in local journalism in recent years in California. We've tried to create, uh, we did a bill, Senator Glazier, uh, Steve Glazier, who actually knows Linda, uh, and he, he, you know, um, uh, he sends his regards to you. Uh, but this bill uh, would, you know, was sought to establish a board that would administer state grants to help bona fide news journalists. Uh, uh, cover issues of importance in their communities to sort of bolster local journalism. We modeled the bill after the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the California Arts Council, which were two successful models for public funding of independent arts and media. You guys can come up if you want. Um, but, okay, well, hopefully they'll, hopefully they'll get here. But um, the bill aimed to create a fund to support grants for news organizations and individuals with the intents to fill the gaps that were created with the decimation of small community news outlets. The bill itself, in, in that form, did not end up pass, was not uh, did not end up passing the, the legislature. Got through the Senate, and got stuck in assembly appropriations for some complicated reasons. But we did end up getting 25 million dollars into our state budget for 123 year uh, fellowships to expand civic journalism. So there was a win there. But there's no question that the, the closure of local newspapers and the decline of most others has created vast news deserts where virtually no local coverage remains. And here's how it actually impacts real people in, in such a tangible way. NPR did a recent piece about how if there is no local newspaper, it literally costs local government on the borrowing market. There is, a, there is an additional uh, uh, you know, quarter of half a point of extra interest rate that you have to pay on your local bonds if there's not a local newspaper. Isn't that crazy? And it's because the, the, the market knows that when there's a local newspaper there, there's going to be someone who's going to ask some questions. The, the, the elected officials and the administrators are going to know there's someone's looking over their shoulder. Uh, they're going to be a little bit more diligent. And they've actually, you know, they've run the actuarial numbers and they've seen that the, the chances of mistakes, of fraud, uh, just over, you know, uh, uh, just, just, uh, just, just, just problems and challenges are so much higher when there's not a local uh, when there's not a local paper looking over the shoulders of the local elected officials. So it, it, there's, a, there's a real absolute kind of measurable cost to communities uh, when, they, when they don't have a, a good uh, local, local, local journalism. Quality journalism tells the truth no matter how uncomfortable or where it leads. And ultimately, a strong and in, independent free press is essential for a thriving and healthy democracy. And I think that our country ignores 
the erosion of public journalism at, 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 at our own peril. So let's, de let's do a little deep dive into this important topic. We're going to hand over to our esteemed moderator, Linda Douglas, who served on both sides of, uh, of, 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 the, of the media curtain, uh, working both in, for CBS and ABC, but also an important uh, communications uh, professional with the Obama administration and in many uh, political capacities. So uh, with that, uh, Linda Douglas, please give a very warm New Deal welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists who I'm about to introduce. Um, I thought I'd actually start by telling you why I'm up here uh, on this topic, uh, because I was a journalist for 35 years, and I spent many of those years here in Washington. I was a network, I was a television journalist. I was a network correspondent. I was the chief Capitol Hill correspondent for ABC News for, for 10 years. But I began my career in local news uh, in Los Angeles for 15 years. And during that time, I was a political reporter only. And so during that time, I covered the city council, the school board, the county board of supervisors, the mayor, the district attorney, the controller, the legislature, the governor's office, and members of Congress um, what, as to what they were doing in their districts for the people who voted for them. So I mean, it was something where you really, really understood how government works at every level. And when I did that work, I really felt like I was serving the public, uh, like I was there I was their eyes and ears. I was uh, operating on their behalf. And in those days, uh, I think the public really saw us as that. You know, they could understand what the issues were, how decisions were being made. We would try to, you know, lift the curtain up. Uh, if you were a, a, a elected official, you used us to communicate uh, with the public, which is a less common <laughs> means of communicating with the public these days. Uh, if there were special interests who were, uh, you know, moving an issue in, in a direction away from the public, uh, that was something that we tried to do. And there were many local outlets, and so there was a lot of competition. So coverage was actually quite uh, innovative. Uh, there was a lot of initiative, and it was pretty aggressive. Uh, and so that was kind of the heyday of the relationship in those days between local news and uh, and the government and the public. And now that environment has changed substantially. Uh, now we are in a world where uh, the public doesn't trust the media. The media doesn't necessarily trust the public. Uh, the public doesn't trust the government particularly or the people who make uh, the decisions on their behalf. Uh, and, and it's very difficult for people like you, elected officials, uh, to use the media. It's much harder uh, to use the media uh, as the vehicle uh, with which you communicate with the public. Uh, and, and of course, there's a crisis in local news, as he was just discussing, which we're going to spend some time talking about, certainly here with this panel of experts. So it really is having uh, a, a very um, worrisome impact on the health of our democracy. And, on, uh, and the health of our democracy is, is dependent upon people being well-informed, uh, trusting their sources of information, uh, and knowing what their elected officials are doing uh, on their behalf or not on their behalf, maybe on behalf of other kinds of interests. So that's what we're going to be talking about here today. And I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. So first I start with Steve Waldman. He is the president and co-founder of Report for America, which is a national service program that uh, places reporters uh, into local newsrooms to report on undercovered uh, communities and issues. And the program now supports 275 reporters in more than 200 local newsrooms. He's also the founder of Rebuild Local, the Rebuild Local News Coalition. That represents 3,000 newsrooms that advocate for public policies to create a stronger and more inclusive uh, local news system. And that second part, the inclusive part, is very, very important to what we're talking about today. And he writes regularly about the local news crisis, and I read all of it, which is why you're here. <laughs> and then we have Amy Mitchell, who uh, is the former managing director of the Journalism Project uh, Research at the Pew Research Center. Uh, so she spent 25 years leading the center's research related to news and information, how the public accesses, uh, engages, and creates news, uh, what news organizations are providing, and how technology is changing all of these elements. And she also um, uh, specializes in the political identity of your news choices, which is very pronounced these days. Uh, not so much as when I was a reporter, but certainly today. 
Um, and then finally, Reed Wilson, a former colleague of mine when I was at Atlantic Media, and he was at National Journal. He's the founder and editor of Pluribus News. It's the nation's only independent news outlet that is dedicated to covering state legislatures, which I'm sure is very good news to all of you out here if you didn't know about this before. He's covered state politics and policy for years at the Hotline, the Washington Post, and the Hill newspaper. And Comedy Central once named him as the greatest political mind of our time. And he hopes they weren't kidding. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> There's a test here now. So, um, so I'm going to start with you, Steve, but please jump in for anybody who has something to add, because this is a, you know, a conversation. Not, not an interview necessarily. And then uh, we'll talk for probably 45 minutes and then I wanna open it up to questions. So think about the questions that you wanna ask because, and you may have questions that are specific to your own situation. So feel free to ask whatever you want. So, um, so we, we're talking about you know, the relationship between news and democracy and how the decline of local news uh, is a very, very important component of that and how local news now is in crisis. What does that mean? Like, how would you describe that crisis? Yeah, it's a little hard to get your head around the scale of this crisis. And when you talk to regular people about, and you say there's a collapse of local news, and they're saying, what are you talking about? I'm overwhelmed by how much news is thrown at me. So you simultaneously have uh, an abundance of information and in national news and a collapse of local news. And there's a lot of measures for that. There's 1,800 different communities in America who have no local news source at all. There are thousands more that have what are now called delightfully ghost newspapers. You've, I'm sure, seen some of these. They come out, there's paper, there's stuff in them, but very, very little coverage of the community. There was one study that said seven, they looked at hundreds of newspapers, Duke, uh, university and they said seventeen percent of the articles in a typical local newspaper are about the community seventeen percent so that and that's the, the the papers that are still there. I tend to think even the better and a lot of this is in rural areas it's it's um, you know this news deserts, which is a new term of art that we didn't have ten years ago refers to this you know we used to talk about how sad it was when a community went from two newspapers to one. That's not what we're talking about now in a lot of places. We're talking about communities that have nothing. And what does that mean when you have nothing? And the, uh, the other way to look at this is in terms of the number of reporters, because we're not here to advocate for, oh, you have to have newspapers with paper and the, you know, whatever the old model is. It's really about whether there's people there, there's reporters, full-time reporters in communities. 57% drop in the number of news newspaper newsroom employees since 2004. And, you know, even for, for you folks, another stat that I don't usually use because it's a little too wonky for most people, but if you look at it in terms of the number of local journalists per dollar spent by state, or lo state and local government, a 67% decline just since 2004. So that gives you a sense of the scale of the collapse. And as, as you said, Linda, the, the consequences for democracy are severe, but even that is a little abstract. Like, we lay, you know, I think part of what we'll talk about is what does that really mean? And you give a great example with the bond, bond ratings. I use that all the time because it's so concrete. Uh, but there's all sorts of, at this point, there's been last five years, for, for a long time, the only person who was doing great work on this was Amy. Now there's been, other people have joined Amy and there's been a whole s slew of academic research in the last five years that has started to quantify what, what are we talking about. And a lot of it is sort of intuitive but still amazing. Yes, lower voting turnout, lower number of people who know the name of the mayor or of their, of their council person, fewer people who are involved in the PTO. Like there's actual correlations between less local news and your likelihood to be involved in civic organizations, uh, more corruption, um, all sorts of civic things. And more recently, two new measures have been added to this discussion. One is polarization. It turns out that when you have less local news, you have more polarization. Now, at first, I have to admit, I thought this was a little bit counterintuitive because we're all troublemakers, journalists, and we like to stir up controversy, so why would there be more polarization if you had fewer journalists? And the reason is that you created a vacuum. 
and the vacuum gets filled by something, and that something is national cable news, talk radio, and social media. So the information is being swapped out. Inf local news information is being swapped out by more polarizing and partisan information, and sources that tend to proliferate misinformation. So those two additional elements, misinformation and polarization, we now put into the conversation on why this matters. And at the end of the day, I think the way I tend to think of it is it makes it very hard for communities and residents of communities to address the problems that are facing them. Amy, do you have anything to add to that? I wanted to talk about the state legislature issue, but you framed the whole crisis so well. Uh, and because it's multifaceted, as you said, uh, in, in so many ways, and it all goes back to creating this this you know environment of toxic mistrust at so many different levels. Um, it, ha, Amy, how do you see this crisis based on your 25 years of uh, analyzing the data and then realizing that we actually have a crisis? Yeah, I think the way Steve laid it out is um, was was really really solid because um, as as you started with Steve, it's really hard to understand the full expanse of what, how this matters and the extent to which it matters. And I would say um, the the point that I was going to add and I'll build off of is what you were talking about at the end, which is that something's going to fill that void. People care about wanting to know what's going on, and that so news becomes a part of what people seek throughout the course of the day. That's partly why it got into all these social media platforms from the beginning, because they weren't designed around news, at least initially. Um, but part of what people are doing over the course of the day is to want to know what's going on. And if you don't have a trusted source to, to do that, you're going to go somewhere, and it's going to come to you in some way. And so then having the tools to figure out in this massive expanse of content what you should actually trust and not trust is, is, is hard to get direction around and you end up going with where your friends go or where your like-minded people go or, or what's right in front of you instead of seeking out what that particular um, uh, trusted long-term long source of news might be in your area. One of the things that we found um, was even several years ago at this point now is that the, when you ask people about the local news that they get, over half of the U.S. population now six years ago was saying most of it was outside the area that you live. So you take the, the stat about the, <clears throat> the content in the newspapers, that definitely resonates with the public and has been for quite some time. I actually just came from a, um, another, an event down in Miami where um, Dr. Shi Sha was among the, the speakers, and he's, as you probably know, is with the White House COVID response team. And one key point he made in his opening remarks was that in all of his planning and all of his thinking about how to approach and manage the COVID-19 pandemic, what he missed, what he made the biggest mistake on was underestimating the importance of the flow of news and information to the public, how much that mattered and how much it impacted the trajectory of, of the pande pandemic itself. And so thinking about the degree to which uh, there's a, a line that uh, uh, is often used that talks about you need facts to get to truth, you need truth to get to a functioning democracy. And we have seen that more and more over the last few, ye few years, the importance of that dynamic. And the news media remains what really writes that first layer of history that speaks to the truth. So getting to understand how in the roles that you all have to be able to uh, uh, understand the value and the importance of that flow of information and how that connects with your constituents and the people that you're representing and speaking to is really essential um, a, as you get off the ground. So we, I want to ask you about the state legislature issue because I know we have state legislators in here. We have some sitting over there. Uh, and so back it, it, for decades, this has been an issue not covering state capitals. When I say that I covered the state legislature, and this is back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, remember I was based in Los Angeles. So the, we'd closed our bureau up in Sacramento, uh, as was, it was a common practice where people were not spending the money to have a, 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 a presence in the state capital. 
And so I would fly up once a week and cover the legislature and whatever was happening that day was what got on the news. That was decades ago. So now that situation has become much, much worse. And the consequences of that, I, I don't even need to explain what the consequences of that are. They are so serious if the public has no idea um, what the people they've just elected to office uh, are doing on their behalf or not doing on their behalf or doing on somebody else's behalf. Um, so first of all, I want to ask you what you're doing. But secondly, why don't voters demand uh, to know more about what the people they've sent up to their state capital uh, are doing on their behalf? Why, why doesn't there seem to be a demand for that coverage? I think we, we live in a, a sort of a world of an inverted pyramid in which we pay attention the most, we as the general public, pays attention the most to the elected officials who are the most prominent and yet have the least impact in our lives. For the state legislators in this room, you all don't, don't run for Congress. You all have more of an impact on your, it's, it's not a good job, but you have more of an impact on your constituents' lives now than you would as a member of Congress, than you would as a US Senator, than you would as President of the United States. Um, when Congress passes an infrastructure bill, uh, you have already heard from Secretary Buttigieg or Will, he's not spending the money. It's not Peter DeFazio, the chairman of the infrastructure committee, who's spending the money. It's you all who are deciding which bridge project and which road project to, um, it gets paved. But at the same time, we have this confluence, uh, this, this um, juxtaposition of what we think of as the media and what actually is the media uh, that I think informs that attention on the rancor here in Washington, D.C. You know, I, I always like to say there are, there are 500 people under the dome up here in, in the Capitol who are chasing around one story. And I love what I do covering the states because I'm the one guy chasing 500 stories. Mm -hmm. And boy, that keeps me interested uh, a lot. But at the same time, when you ask people what the media is, correct me if I'm wrong here, Amy, I think they would say something like with CNN and Fox News and MSNBC. It's cable news. When in fact, it's what Steve does. And it's what, you know, the, 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 I mean, how many, how many newsrooms? 200 newsrooms you're in? That's amazing. That's fantastic. Good for you. Uh, can I have some of those? Uh, <laughs> but so we, we, we think about the media. Cable news has taken the place of the media broadly. And therefore, that drives the discussion of federal politics and federal controversies as opposed to what really matters in our lives. And there's a sexiness issue, um, arguments over uh, uh, you know, the, the federally sh shutting down the federal government are a lot more attractive and appealing than stories about paving local, um, you know, paving local roads or something like that. Um, because by and large, and legislators in the room, correct me if you think I'm wrong, 99% of the time we hear about a state legislature at the national level, it's because they're doing something crazy. It's because Fox News is outraged about it or MSNBC is outraged about it, and so they're going to talk about it nonstop. Whereas 99% of the stuff that you all actually do is pretty bipartisan, and it's because you've got to pass a budget and you've got to get the policy done. And by the way, most states are wholly controlled by one party or the other. And so there isn't the sort of partisan rancor that you hear in Washington, D.C. Uh, I will say personally, the fights where uh, Democrats are attacking Democrats and Republicans are attacking Republicans is a lot more interesting to me uh, than sort of the national level stuff. But I'll leave that to another, another moment. Um, why, why don't we demand that? We don't demand that because to both Amy and Steve's point earlier, um, because we conflate news with cable controversy and yell fests. And that's not what real news is. Um, and real news may not be as exciting as, as, and, and as sort of deliver the dopamine that that, um, that that shout fest does, but boy, I think it's hugely important. And I mean, to your point, Linda, I remember when I was at the Washington Post, the first time I went out to California, um, those of you from California will know this, but in the, the center of the state capitol building, there's a press room. And it's where the governor comes out and gives his budget address or legislators uh, you know, hold their press conferences. And I walked in with a buddy of mine from the Los Angeles Times, and I look around and in every space there's a, a little plaque that has the name of the news outlet that's supposed to sit there. And of course there's no plaque for the Washington Post because I'm the only guy who was out there. And, uh, and I, I say to my buddy, where, where do I sit? Everybody's got a space. He says, sit wherever you want. 70% of these publications either don't exist or don't send somebody to Sacramento anymore. So, you know, 
take whatever seat you want and somebody else will sit wherever they can too. Um, that is the case in literally every state legislature in America, but for the fact that there were more publications to close down in California. You know, I'm, I'm from Washington State. In Washington State now, I think we're at four and a half reporters who cover the, the Capitol um, in, in a state with 10 members of Congress and, you know, six million people, seven million people, something like that. Um, it is, that is, in fact, the case in absolutely every single uh, state legislature in America. And the last thing I'll say about this, to your point about corruption, the places where corruption is most prevalent, as, as measured by the number of legislative, legislators or elected officials who are actually sentenced to corruption investigation, or sentenced to corruption crimes, um, are in fact the smallest states. It's not, you know, we hear a lot about Illinois and Chicago and all that stuff. It's the Dakotas. It's North Dakota and South Dakota because there's nobody in the state capitals covering these places. Um, there is nobody in Jefferson City, Missouri, uh, which is, you know, well, I, I should say, with the exception of an exceptional journalism program at the University of Missouri, who has their own capital bureau there. Um, but in a lot of places, uh, a lot of these state capitals, you all know this, they're not the biggest cities in America. They're um, places where people, legislators have to go and spend time overnight away from their families, uh, and the less transparency there is, you know, the more the institutional culture takes over, the more people can do things behind closed doors uh, and without that scrutiny, uh, the more the smoke-filled room uh, plays a big role, and the more misbehavior takes place. So I, I think there's a pretty clear correlation between the distance from a major population center or a major newspaper, uh, the, the uh, maybe proximity to a news desert, uh, the decline in coverage and the increase in corruption uh, that takes place in state governments. And there are other consequences as well uh, to there not being a local news presence. Uh, certainly for all of you, uh, your uh, frustration must be that it is hard to get your, uh, your, it's hard to get your own message out to the people you're trying to, you know, either seek support from or actually seek votes from depending on where you are in the cycle. So, I mean, that's got to be the extreme frustration for you. But um, I wanted to ask all of you, and Steve, you had a good example of this that I, that I read about. Can you give us an example of the impact on a community of, uh, of the hollowing out of local news? So say there's no local news presence or almost no local, local news presence. Can you give us an example, any of you, but I know you have a good one, of, of the impact of that? Well, are you thinking of the California, the, the Bell? Well, the most famous example is Bell, California. And part of the problem with this is that it's always hard to prove a negative, like what do you how do you prove something bad's going on when there's no one there to tell you that there's something bad going on? And the Bell, California example became famous because it was a, there was basically no one covering this uh, kind of fairly working class community. Um, and so the city council kept, uh, or kept giving pay raises to the uh, city manager up until around $800,000, I think, he was getting paid. And the, the amazing thing about it, it was all done in public. They voted on it. You know, it, was, uh, it wasn't like you know, secret hush payments or something like that. They just voted on it, but there was no one there. And then eventually someone from the Los Angeles Times came in and did a story on it. We also we see sort of more, slightly less dramatic but meaningful examples of this in Report for America all the time, where like one example that comes to mind is in eastern Kentucky. We had a reporter uh, who was placed in a, a, a county in eastern Kentucky through the Lexington Herald Leader that hadn't had a reporter there in a long time in the whole, in the county. And he, he got there and again, it was not like a six month long investigative project. He just started going to public meetings and he noticed that a bunch of the public meetings, they started to say, you know, we haven't had running water for three weeks now. now you can imagine like if you're in New York or, or DC or something like that, if you didn't have running drinking water for three weeks, it would be a it would be a big thing. But they had gotten a little bit used to it because the situation had been that bad, and so he came in and just started doing stories about how there was no running drinking water in this county in eastern Kentucky, and it caught on and it got it, it was in the Lexington Hour Leader and the TV stations picked it up and eventually they had the governor put in five million dollars for trying to repair the water. Now we haven't I don't know whether it's happened. But, you know, that's another good example of, like, who knows how many other cases there are like that that we don't even know about yet. 
So let's talk about news consumption habits, because I'll bet that we, uh, depending on your generation, uh, have different views of how people consume news and different age groups and different demographic groups in different parts of the country. Uh, but I'll bet that, that, you, that none of us exactly have a grasp of how people are getting their information today. We may think we know. We think everybody watches Fox News if you live here in Washington. Uh, you think that all young people only look at TikTok, and that's maybe kind of true, actually. But Amy, this is where um, you all, all the great work that you've done you know, really comes into play. I mean, I don't mean for you to rattle off a whole bunch of numbers that you have to look up or whatever, but how, how have news consumption habits changed? Uh, and what the harder question is, what are the consequences of those changing news consumption habits in your view? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to study because it has changed so much. Um, but I think there, there are two, well, two dynamics occurring at the same time, well, three really, that are feeding into just the chaos of what the news environment is today. And not all in a negative way, I think is important to point out, but certainly in an impactful way, and, and in some cases negative. One is that we have had this technological explosion, right? And so people are going to all different kinds of platforms and pathways for news. Digital is primary now, so you've got about, you know, I won't do too many stats, but 82% of U.S. adults who are uh, at least sometimes getting news through a digital platform, which could be your phone, could be your laptop, could be any one of these. Uh, and then we also have, you still have over half, about 62% that are getting news through television, at least sometimes. A lot of that is local TV in addition to cable. Um, print and, and radio are way down with print really at the bottom. But within digital, you then have the social media, you have the websites and apps, and our younger generation, our youngest adults, and it's really important to not to, to be aware of the fact that a they have never they have grown up in a time when they've never been expected to pay for news they never thought it was an automatic part of news consumption it's always been available anytime anywhere and it's mixed in with all of the other kind of content they're getting throughout the course of the day. And so we're at a point now where you have your 18 to 29 year olds, trusty news are getting through social media almost as much as their trusty news from national organizations or directly from local news organizations. And again, it's not all negative, what depends on where that news is coming from, right? Is it a link somebody sent you that you're not paying attention to? Is it from a news organization that you're landing on but you don't remember it because you're not paying attention to the brand when you're in social media? But there's this plethora of, um, of, of just ways to get news that people like you all have to keep up with. In addition, part of what technology has allowed is a wealth of different kinds of producers of news, some of which is allowed nonprofits and others that are smaller to get into the space and actually reach parts of the population in a way that would have been too expensive to do in the past. So there's a little bit of benefit, even though we're also seeing a dramatic decline in the revenue and availability going to some of the more traditional kinds of outlets. So there's a lot wider sources. You tack onto that the political polarization of our country, which was you know, pushing, uh, um, uh, really increasing, even back in 2014, we were really beginning to see that and then shot, shot up in 2016 and beyond. And so people are just choosing to be in different spaces. Uh, and there's generational differences, there's political differences, there's differences based on where you are in your country. So it's a massive array of stuff <laughs> and trying to be able to differentiate between the really valuable producers, trusted sources of news that are doing true journalism, those that are just putting content out, those are putting misinformation out, makes it a really difficult place for everybody, including the public and including yourselves. And so trying to create relationships with journalists to be able to um, you know, have um, uh, uh, messaging and stories and content that's getting out becomes, you know, really, really crucial today. And on the subject of social media, um, it just seems to me uh, that uh, younger people who were not trained to have the habit of starting the morning with consuming 
you know, a, a, a wide selection of news items that was in a newspaper where you might see the actual international news or you might see the sports, even though you didn't necessarily follow sports. You know, there was, a, there was kind of a, a set um, uh, supply of news that uh, older generations were used to consuming that younger generations are not. So what they're doing is snacking. I, I, I've always called this news snacking. So you see a headline, uh, or you see an alert, or you see something on Twitter or uh, some other social media platform, and you think you know what's happening. Then you know, there's, you know something happened in Ukraine. What does anybody here on this panel know? What the consequences of that are? Because it seems to be, as you say, with social media now being the number one, uh, or, or the is it the most common source of news now for people under thirty? Uh, social media, as, news and as information? A, yeah, as a pathway. Yeah. So what are the consequences of this uh, kind of frenzied supply of alerts and headlines and social media posts in terms of how well-informed people are? Has anybody studied that? Well, it's lack of in-depth understanding of an issue. I mean, if you're reading, you know, snippets about it, there, you know, I would say in many cases you see an awareness about world events or other kinds of events in our younger population that may, they may not have known about 25 years ago because they weren't paying attention to news at all, so there's a little bit of news getting to them, but across the board it tends to be very surface level without a deep understanding or a connecting of the dots as to why that matters or conversation about it. And so it's grab and go and I gotta quickly move on to the next thing. There have been a lot of studies about the difference in reading in offline versus reading online and the way your brain actually functions differently in terms of cognitive um, exploration and, and understanding and remembering. So that across the board makes a huge difference. But these little tidbits, you, you're, not, you're not digging in. And I think we see people care about local issues that affect their day-to-day -day living. When we ask people about sort of what do, you, what do you care about most, it is traffic issues. But they don't get to where they want to understand the piece of legislation so that then they can you know, have input and have say and understand why that road's going to be shut down for six weeks. Yeah, go ahead. Well, there's also a practical business implication to this, which is if you look if you get your news, you look at a headline in the first sentence and you think, okay, that's all I need, that means you're not clicking through. And that means that the news organization is not going to monetize it. So part of why, part of, we haven't talked about why has local news collapsed. The big reason that local news has collapsed is not so much that they've lost readers, it's that they've lost advertisers. And if you're, if you're consuming the, the material uh, on Facebook and Google and you're feeling like, okay, that gave me most of what I need, then you're not going to the news site, and so they're not able to, and there's all sorts of reasons why even when you do, the news organizations aren't good enough at, at you know, turning that into a viable business model. The other thing is, it depends on what the snack is. I suspect that if we really could do, you know, eye tracking studies 50 years ago of people reading newspapers, Probably a lot of it was just snacking also, but they would eventually get to a handful of things that they, they went deeper in. I remember talking to someone, I think it was at Facebook, about like kind of prodding them to try to surface local news. And they said, and they said yeah, we've looked into doing that, but every time we do, we can't find any. <laughs> Meaning, now, I'm sure that's an exaggeration, but, but the point is real. Like, there, if there's, this is why I keep coming back to reporters. More than out. If there's no if there's no reporters doing actual reporting on the local level, then it's not only will the the bites be bite sized, they won't actually be about local. And we are going to talk about what's working, by the way, because we're not going to end on like a hopeless note here. But what, while we're wallowing in hopelessness, let's continue to talk about the state of things today. Um, what do you think is the most, or maybe the data shows this um, already, the most trusted source? Uh, of news right now uh, in terms of people's lives. I mean, people, you know, outside of, take Washington and it's not a real place and set it aside. Uh, you know, in terms of, of, the, of, of ordinary citizens' lives, what is the most trusted source of news, do you think? Well, what's interesting is if you just ask about it, you know, in general, um, it, it depends on your politics. 
Uh, and, and that's a really, you know, that's a big problem today. So we see a massive divide in, it's not just where people go, it's what they trust, it's also what they distrust. So there's a big factor in here is the rejection of anything that's not in your inner circle of a check mark because you've chosen to trust it. Uh, so you've got Fox News on one side, you've got CNN is high at the top of another as well as a whole mix of others. So if you're with folks on the left, there's a wider array of sources that are trusted, but the ones that are distrusted are the ones that are most trusted by those on the right politically. Um, if you look at it by um, sort of broader subject area categories, um, your local news outlets still uh, across U.S. adults are get the highest level of trust measure, about 25% that express a, a great deal of trust in local news, drops to about 20% or so for national. Um, and overall, you get down quite low into the high single digits for social media, but that's where it really changes when you get, when you look at it um, by age. So one of the things that has definitely affected uh, the office holders here in this room uh, is, is this. So the, the decline of local news has, uh, has had a, uh, in addition to the decline of local news, you've had the growth of national news. So more and more now, and it's been going on for like the last really 20 years, the reporters live in Washington, D.C. or New York. Uh, I mean, again, I was a reporter in Los Angeles, and we don't really pay attention to the news from Los Angeles very much. It's very strange, because California used to be a trendsetter in so many ways, and now I would I, you know, give anybody in Washington a quiz on anything that's going on in California. So that's, that's a kind of a, a side issue, but still surprising. But the concentrating of news in Washington in particular seems to me to have led to the nationalization of issues. So all of you who are running in your like you know, your municipality or your state or your county uh, are finding yourselves uh, forced to uh, play in the culture wars because those are the national issues and that's what Cable is talking about and that's what reporters are covering and that's what the few reporters who are local reporters might be listening to. So I'm wondering, um, and any of you can weigh in on this, maybe Reed, I'll start with you. Um, what is the effect of nationalizing the topics uh, on governing? Because political campaigns, it's, they have to at least be prepped on these culture issue wars, you know, whether you live in a, you know, an all white county somewhere in the middle of the country, you better have a point of view on critical race theory teaching in schools, because it's gonna come up. So what do you think is the effect on, on governing of the nationalizing of the, of the conversation that has kind of been one of the many consequences of local news disappearing? So this is why Pluribus News exists, and forgive me for doing the, the spiel, um, but, I've seen exactly what you just talked about. Uh, too often, one of two things happens. First of all, something happens in D.C., and then you all are asked to, to deal with it in your state legislatures. Uh, and much of that, or it, it may not happen in D.C., it may happen on cable news, and the critical race theory thing is, is a perfect example. Uh, I would challenge anybody in this room a year ago to be able to come up with any kind of definition of critical race theory. God knows I didn't know one. Um, then all of a sudden it became an issue, well, it was a little more than a year ago, I guess. Virginia, the Virginia governor's race was really the first time that it became a thing. And it was, by the way, it became a thing because of a, uh, you know, a concerned parent in Loudoun County who just happened to work for a prominent Republican super PAC. Um, shock and surprise, I know. Um, but after critical race theory came up in the Virginia governor's race, and then it became a big thing in, uh, on the Fox News circuit. I watched, and this happens all the time, I watched it pop up in every state legislature in America. And the red states all immediately acted to, to end critical race theory, and they're still, they're still working on it. The lieutenant governor of Texas just made it a top priority of his for the next session. Um, and the divide here is that, you know, state legislators are, um, they, they, you, you all don't have the levels of support or the infrastructure that a member of Congress does, right? You don't have the staff. Um, you're, most of you are probably doing this as second jobs or retirement projects or whatever you're having, you happen to do. I don't, I don't see a lot of retirees in this room, so <laughs> second jobs probably. Um, 
and and where are you getting your own ideas for what happen for for what you can do to to improve your state? You're, please tell me you're not getting it from Fox News or MSNBC. Um, you're probably getting it, and, and this is this is what what our mission is. You're probably getting it from your colleagues in another state. You're probably going to NCSL or CSG or whatever, uh, and and talking to your friends and colleagues from from other states who have a good idea on infrastructure or healthcare or whatever topic you happen to be interested in, and you're trying to figure out a good way to model it for your state. So what I always say is, you know, what happens in Sacramento or Albany or Austin today is going to happen in 25 states next year, and then it'll happen federally the year after that. And forgive me for slightly disagreeing with you, but what happens in California hugely matters for the rest of the country. California just passed... Just not to Washington. Well, but it, but it will. <laughs> it will. Uh, California just passed this, this bill called the Kids Code. We have a couple Californians in the room, right? Do you vote for Kids Code? The, this is the, the thing that passed in, in early September. It governs how social media companies can use algorithms it's to like target the, kids. The Kids Online kids Safety right, right. Act. Yeah. Uh, no, it passed. It passed. It, in California, it passed. It's a stronger version. No, okay. Yeah. A version passed. Uh, and, and once it passed, we knew the Republican in Minnesota who's going to introduce her version and the Democrat in New York who's going to introduce his version coming next year. This is like, this is the low-hanging fruit of, you know, as tech policy becomes hugely partisan, uh, the, you know, targeting kids' privacy. Like, that's the low-hanging bipartisan fruit that everybody's going to do. This happens more often than you think. Welfare reform in the 1990s was a program of four Republican governors in the Midwest before Bill Clinton took it over. The Affordable Care Act came out of Massachusetts. Don't tell Mitt Romney. Uh, criminal justice reform in the 90s, right, in, uh, under Trump, the one like bipartisan thing that he did, started out as, if you can believe it, a joint project of the Koch brothers and George Soros in places like Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas. State policy, what you guys do now, but in, in one of your states, the kernel of the next president's defining legacy is being debated on the floor. I just don't know what it is. If any of you have an idea, I'd be happy to hear about it. Um, but this is, this is the, the, the uh, disconnect, I feel like. On a national level, we all only want to talk about what's happening in D.C. But we don't realize that what's happening in D.C. now happened 10 years ago in the States. And so that's why, I mean, Pluribus News exists to put those puzzle pieces together to find that kernel of the next legacy. And, by the way, we rely hugely on local media to do so. Local media, I mean, they, that's where I get my story ideas uh, for the next 10 years. So... Um, we, I mean, we exist to cover you all, and you all may not realize it now, but you're setting national policy. It just may not be national policy for five or ten years. Steve? There may be one additional factor on a human level. I'm curious whether you've, you've seen this, which is when, when we're all focused on national issues, it becomes easier for us to demonize each other because your, your opponent, the person you would de disagree with, is someone in the other part of the country that you just saw on, on TV, not your neighbor. And it's not like local issues aren't controversial and people scream at each other on local issues too, but it is a little bit different when you know you're gonna see the person the next day. Or sometimes they're cross-cutting cleavages, like the person who you may be arguing with about where to put the wastewater treatment plant, you may agree with them on national politics. So there's a little bit of sometimes the local cleavages are different than the, na or at least it used to be. Maybe that's less and less. And that, I think, has a little bit of a tendency to make the demonization a little uh, less. So uh, we do want to have time for questions, but I want to ask uh, a, a couple of wrap-up questions here uh, before we go. Um, number one, uh, let's just start with this area first. What's working right now in terms of efforts to bring local news back uh, and what's not? And is there a role for government to play? Well, I can, I can talk about the government part of it. Uh, I, we, we formed this coalition, about the Rebuild Local News Coalition, about two or three years ago. And I would say it's a kind of coalition of the reluctant because no journalism group, no journalist really wants to get the government involved in supporting journalism. Uh, but uh, two things have happened. One is the collapse is so severe that w most people have come to believe that just tweaking the business model and, and philanthropy is probably not gonna be enough. And two is that some ideas have emerged that are 
First Amendment friendly, uh, where people are starting to see, oh, okay, this could be done in a way that doesn't hinder uh, editorial freedom. And by the way, this is just in the last year, we're starting to get a lot of incoming calls and emails from people who want to do this on the state and local level. And I'll mention just a few things quickly, and then afterwards, I'm happy to talk more about this. But uh, our coalition ended up gravitating around a, a proposal called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, which is a very different approach than we've known. It's not like PBS, it's not a a government grant program. It's, it's a series of tax credits, a tax credit, a payroll tax credit for news organizations that hire or retain local reporters, a tax credit for consumers to purchase subscriptions or donate to a local non nonprofit news, and a tax credit for small businesses that advertise in local media. So it's, it's bipartisan or more bipartisan because it's, it's you know, you're amplifying the buying power of the consumer or the business. You're not having a, you know, a group sitting around deciding who ought to get it. And that has given it some, really passed the House, the payroll tax credit passed the House of Representatives. And the Wisconsin legislature is now, the Republicans in the Wisconsin legislature are now pushing the small business tax credit, the tax credit for uh, small businesses that advertise in local press. So there's a bunch of things going on that feel like it could really help, but in a way that doesn't lend itself as much to political manipulation. And I'll mention one other idea because we literally are hearing, literally are hearing about this from in, on the city level, the state level, and the federal level, which is the idea of doing something with all the money that governments spend on their own advertising. So the federal government spends about a billion dollars on advertising. A lot of that's military recruitment, but depending on what year it is, it could be census or public health or things like that. Most of that goes to social media and cable and billboards and things like that. Very little of it goes to local news. So what New York City recently did, the CUNY, CUNY Graduate School of Journalism uh, at, uh, in New York did a study and they found out that only 17%, I think, of the... New York City's ad spending went to community media. And so they said, you should require that 50% should go to community media. And so they did, and it led to 200 different little local newspapers getting really significant funding. It didn't involve any additional spending. The, the ad spending budget for the city stayed the same. They just looked at it a little bit differently. And so we're here, that's like, I would say, the hot topic right now in this little, arcane world of media policy and local news. I think there's some real risks to it, by the way, like the possibility of, you know, the mayor or the governor getting in there and, you know, pulling ad spending is, is real. So I think, I think it's solvable, but we should be, you know, have our eyes wide open about it. But the, the main point is that two years ago, no one was talking about public policy as a, re as, as a remedy on this at all. And now it's a very hot topic. And I, I think that's good, uh, but we also have to do it in a really thoughtful way. I, I'd add just one thing, and I, think, I do think that the key is to be really thoughtful about any, like what potential long-term implications there can be and to have thought you know, through those um, in advance when, some, when a nefarious actor could be uh, elected leader that makes those decisions, and also anything that can be carried outside, whether outside the U.S. or elsewhere. Um, but I would say two other areas of positive, um, not on the government side, but if we think about some of the opportunities, you know, I would say one of the things we've seen is some tremendous newly created news outlets like Pluribus, like certain entities that are focused on black women, that are focused on you know, ve some very niche areas that could not have existed in the past without the ability to have that digital community and that digital outreach. So I do think there's some really terrific work being done um, that has promise. And 
along those same lines, there's also much more collaboration across news outlets from by either carrying the content that somebody else, that a small three-person nonprofit is producing in your news outlet, by talking amongst each other, by figuring out how you can collaborate on stories. So there is a lot more collaboration in, in news itself than I think you both could agree there used to be. And then finally, I would say it has also, there is also innovation that's happening in a way that, you know, innovation happens when you kind of have to have it happen. And so as challenging and as many negatives as there are, which are really real, I do think there's positive. And the final is that, that people care. We just need to get people to care in the right way. And so I, we are almost completely out of time, and I want to be sure to get a couple questions in. Uh, I just, if any of you want to grab these guys on the way out, I think one thing that you probably all want to know is how you should be handling the press, which wasn't really the topic of our panel. I mean, I would say, being in communications, that I would tell you to always remember that reporters are people and treat them like human beings and treat them with respect and try to answer their inquiries promptly and uh, always tell the truth. I mean, there's some basics there, <laughs> but uh, but you know, these folks who work in these fields might have other advice for you on that as well. So let me just go ahead and see if we got a couple of questions before we wrap this up in about four minutes. <laughs> yes. I'm Scott Holcomb from Atlanta, Georgia, and a friend of mine who's who's a journalist. She she had this wonderful statement that. Uh, paper newspapers will exist as long as we have park benches and breakfast. Um, I'm less sure that she's right uh, over time, but uh, for the life of me, I can't get my two kids to read a paper newspaper for anything. Um, and one of the things that didn't come up, but I think about a lot too in terms of the big picture issues of democracy is while we're living in a time where we have access to so much information, how much of it are we retaining for historical purposes and the like? Like many updates on what we do, the links fade pretty quickly. So from research aspects and everything, uh, I, I think there's a loss there. But what I want to ask you about is, um, as an outsider who is not in your profession, but our profession suffers from it as well, is the issue of trust. And journalists are suffering from a lack of trust across the board. and my sense is there are real pressures to do things like clickbait, to do the things that you know are going to get attention that maybe aren't in the best interests of having an informed citizenry, but that you have to do to keep the lights on. So can you talk about how you navigate through that and, and, and consider those issues? Well, one, one other trend that's a positive trend is there has been a, a growth in nonprofit local news. 400 local nonprofit websites, not public radio stations, but websites that didn't exist 10 years ago. Sort of little mini ProPublicas in communities around the country. And Report for America, one of the things that we do, we, we recruit talented journalists from all over the country, and newsrooms apply to us. We pay half the salary and then place these reporters. There's one big thing that the newsroom has to prove to us, though, which is what's the beat? We only fund beat reporting. And the, the reason is that we think that there needs to be more depth. And there's a second reason, which is that we think that at the end of the day, trust is going to, is a hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, effort. Like we're only going to rebuild trust with, I think about 50,000 more local reporters. We're only gonna be able to rebuild trust on a one-to-one -one or human-to-human -human level. And when you have the philanthropic angle on that, that per, per, creates, at least in the best case scenarios, a guard against clickbait. I had this great moment where we, we, two of our early reporters were placed in the Chicago Sun-Times, and their beat was anything but crime on the west side of Chicago. And the managing editor was quoted somewhere as saying, yeah, it's kind of frustrating. I mean, there's usually, there's always some murder and we want to get Carlos and Manny to cover it, but we promised Report for America we wouldn't do that. And I could tell he had a little like twinkle in his eye when he said that, because he liked being forced to actually have the reporters not do the clickbait. But the only way they can get away with doing that is because there's money attached to it. It's like there's a philanthropic thing saying, we're basically paying you not to do clickbait. We're paying you to do a deeper dive into a certain beat. Now that's not the only solution, but I think that is one of the encouraging aspects 
to the rise in the philanthropic role. And by philanthropy, that can mean big foundations and small donations uh, in local news. You. And so the how question is the role of private, private equity, equity and ownership, ownership and how that's a part of this and again what we can be doing as elected officials about it. Thank you. Um, half the daily newspaper circulation in America right now is owned by a hedge fund yeah. or a private equity fund. That is a hugely significant factor in, in why this. And I think this is an area where public policy has been completely asleep. Like we have had absolutely no antitrust scrutiny of hedge fund and private equity basically taking over half of the newspaper industry. So I think there are public policy remedies that need to, we should stop just shrugging our shoulders and saying, oh, well that's just the way capitalism works, you know, the hedge funds are gonna buy up all the local newspapers, too bad we can't do anything about that. I think there are things we can do if we're creative about it. Okay, and with that, I think we're, one more? Okay. One more. Okay. So on the other side of this, I'm from Florida, and we have this rise of for-profit journalism that is pay to play. Like there's a guy, you, you, have, you pay him, and then he writes nice stories about you. Um, is that happening in other places in the country, and how, what can we do about that? Yeah, I've heard about this guy. Uh, or a couple of them down in Florida. I guess it's not just one, right? Um, yeah, this is happening. It's, it's a thing. And I've, I've actually, in, so we're a new company, Pluribus News, and we have, have I mentioned our name before? <laughs> I get a little self-conscious, but yeah. <laughs> it's on your dollar, it's on your money. Just look on your money. Yeah. Um, Good branding idea. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, I have, so we've been spending the last couple of months introducing ourselves to people in D.C. who are going to buy advertising and, and all of this stuff. And... Um, I've had a couple of people who have asked me, like, whoa, if we advertise, can we get good? I'm like, whoa, buddy, that is not, not going to happen. And as a matter of fact, I had a, uh, one of our recent advertisers contact one of my reporters for a, a story that they wanted you know, to pitch, which is totally legitimate. Like, they, the, it is you know, just because somebody does or does not advertise with us does not mean that we will or will not cover them. There's just a big, giant firewall. In, a, in an appropriate and a proper newsroom between the editorial side and the business side. And so when one of my reporters came to me and said, hey, our advertiser just contacted me, I, I said, look, uh, that's it. Don't say anything more to me. You deal with our managing editor who doesn't do anything on the ad side, because I do in a little bit. They um, say, you, you talk to him. If you think it's a story, then you guys decide that. That's not, you know, I'm, I'm no longer a part of this decision. And uh, hopefully that's what's happening in every newsroom in America. It's very clearly not happening in every newsroom for America in America. But that pay to play thing, that is happening. And that's a really, that scared the bejesus out of me when I heard about it, especially coming out of Florida. There's um, 1,500 of these pink slime websites and counting across the country. That's the term of art that we're using, pink slime sites. This is a major new trend, 1,500 at least. And they're taking advantage of the trust that people, the fact that people still tend to trust local more and abusing it uh, for, in a way that's going to make the trust go down the tubes. Yeah. Which, of course, is the core problem that we were di discussing at the very beginning of this panel. Well, thank you very much. These were great experts that we had here. So thank you.